I think just generally speaking, like the, the Kurdish issue as it's been called in the past, um, I think having um, um, concern for is just having a concern for the Middle East in general. We know that having um, addressing the Kurdish issue, which is the autonomy of the different regions in Kurdistan, having the right of people, you know, the human rights of people to educate their kids in their native language, to give the names uh, that you want to give them in their native tongue, be able to name your kids the names they want to name them. It's all part of the democratic and human rights that should be expected. We know that in the past when uh, their, the human rights of uh, Kurdish people, when whatever part of Kurdistan they were in, was taken away, or central governments would infringe on their democratic rights, that there would be unrest, it would lead to conflict, it would lead to violence in the end. Um, those, all of those things lead to more instability in the region. Instability leads to you know, drug trafficking, leads to uh, the deaths of people. So it just, it's about security, it's about stability in the region, it's about ensuring the, the economic and democratic future of the people in the different parts of Kurdistan. So I think that's why it's important, that's why I'm concerned about it. Uh, as you know, the so I, I like, I'm also the founder of uh, the Parliamentary Friends of the Kurds. One of the things that we always look towards is, and I always say, rinse and repeat, that like, democracy doesn't just happen overnight, and it didn't happen overnight in any of the British parliamentary systems across the world. And a peaceful transition of power, it's that rinse and repeat. It's your ability to hold elections and have you know, political parties compete. And even if there's one political party that wasn't power, that loses, or the people have changed, when there's a peaceful transition of power, that's the mark of an emerging kind of civic democracy that's actually functional and working. And it, it just shows that it's on the right path, that Kurdistan is on the right path towards democracy. And I'll be able to sustain it in the future as people get into practice and get used to seeing uh, political parties compete, political uh, leaders compete, lose, win, and it doesn't resort to violence, which is a good thing. So rinse and repeat is very important. That's how uh, the British Westminster parliamentary system got started, and it works really well because Canada is a great example of that. So I'd like to see that happen in Kurdistan as well. Yeah. I think in the case of Kurdistan, especially in northern Iraq and the KRG government, so the government of um, this unity government basically that faced off against Daesh, against ISIS, they bore the brunt. So Kurdish people, Yazidi people, uh, Syrians who lived in Mosul, they all bore the brunt when uh, ISIS spilled over the border and then started to make its trek towards Mosul and then further south on its way towards Baghdad. So they bore the brunt of the impact. And it's a testament to the leadership that they didn't break and it allowed time for allied forces, whether they're American, Canadian, or any one of the other allied forces, uh, to bring troops, to bring aircraft, to bring supplies, and then to support those on the ground who are doing the hard fighting of pushing back uh, ISIS uh, military forces back across the border into Syria. So uh, I, I think it's a testament. Which it's one of the big reasons why I think when allied countries, Western countries, look towards who are uh, reliable allies in the Middle East, we immediately think of the Kurds, regardless of uh, where the boundaries are. We think about uh, you know, countries like Turkey, which is a member of NATO. Uh, but our go-to point is, first of all, is the KRG Peshmerga units, because we know we can count on them to provide you know, an effective militia on the ground. So I, I think it's important. I think it's important for a couple of reasons. Again, that stability issue, we know that if, if we have people in the different parts of Kurdistan who feel safe in their areas, who feel like their human and democratic rights are being respected by their central governments, when there's autonomy, the ability to make decisions in your region for yourself, um, being able to teach the Kurdish language, being able to speak Sorani and Kurmanji, whatever it is, without having a central government tell you you're not allowed to do that. All of those things lead to more stability. It leads to more economic activity. And I think the great opportunity for Canada is, and we have an office now in Erbil, which is doing more than just trade, but starting to establish those parliament to parliament, people to people relationships. And I think the long term is Canada getting more invested in the region and uh, being able to both companies being able to have that security of knowing that if you send employees overseas, if you hire people locally, um, that there's opportunity to both make money, to get exchanges going. Um, and then, again, it's that the people to people exchanges. We have a large and growing uh, uh, Canadian population with uh, Kurdish heritage or Yazidi heritage, and that is just going to increase over time. And that is going to lead to more people wanting to do business 
uh, in, in the Kurdistan region because they have either family members or business people that they know and they also know the lay of the land much better than others do so they can find those economic and business opportunities that others can't. That's one of the great advantages that Canada has. We have large diaspora groups from all different parts of the world and they typically do a lot of business with their country of origins. What is your... So here in Ottawa, I've, I've always been pushing the government to expand our representation in Erbil, open a bigger office, which I'm glad that now we have kind of an outpost almost of the embassy that has started in Erbil, and it, more connections, so more connections uh, with Dohuk, with Suleimaniya, and I've, one of the things that uh, the Parliamentary Friends of the Kurds has been working on is uh, a report that really would encourage the government to do more university exchanges. Uh, there is a Canadian university in Kurdistan, CUK, it's the University of Alberta that had signed an agreement. Uh, things like that, you know, giving some of our Canadian know-how in the region, more of it. Government, the Canadian government should be doing more of it. I think on the Kurdish side is focus on parliament. Uh, Parliament is really important. I know there's a, there's a tendency to focus on the executive. That happens in Canada too. It's not something unique to Kurdistan by any stretch. It happens here too, but Parliament is really important, both because you can debate the ideas, uh, the constituents and residents of the different parts uh, in the KRG can then go back to their legislators, tell them what they're thinking about government policies. And also another thing is broaden the economy beyond just oil and gas or agriculture and build infrastructure uh, whichever way possible. Like those are like the basic building blocks of uh, becoming more autonomous in the region. And again, rinse and repeat, a democratic, peaceful democratic transitions are really important for democracies. The more you can do them and repeat them over time, the more you establish as a legitimate kind of Western behaving uh, local government. And the more certainty then you have is that Western governments will support you. And you've seen it in other parts of the world, uh, governments that tend to adopt Western ways of you know, running the government, running parliaments, uh, obeying you know, international standards and customs when it comes to human rights, you can then expect Western governments to come to your support and come to your aid when you need them. So one of the things I think it begins again, that, that parliament to parliament relationship, and I, I talked to Representative Bayan yesterday, and uh, we, we were discussing actually having an exchange of parliamentarians, so a group of parliamentarians from Canada traveling to the region. And it would be, that's one of the building blocks, is one of the starting points, is for Canadian parliamentarians to sit down with Kurdish parliamentarians and then explain kind of, this is how our system works, and this is how co committees do our work here, and why do we do it in this way? Those types of building blocks go beyond just government to governments who have a political relationship that they need to uh, look after, and it changes with every election. Parliaments have more stability because parliamentarians tend to return from election to election. Uh, it's not just a wholesale change. When a government changes, everybody changes in the government. Parliaments tend to have a group of people who stay on either for one or two or three or four terms, and then that changes. So a parliament to parliament relationship. And I'll give you an example. In Canada, we have Canada, uh, U.S. Parliamentary Friendship Group. So it's an association. Over 100 members uh, participate in it. And it's formed a very strong relationship between Canada and United States legislators. So parliamentarians here will travel to the United States. United States parliamentarians will travel here, members of the Congress. And it's a much deeper relationship that goes just beyond uh, uh, governments talking to each other. And it's getting to know your districts, getting to know uh, your staff members, getting to know how you do your daily work helps also, and I've seen this before, pick up uh, you know, new ideas of how to do things, new forms of uh, the local democracy that can be practiced. So those are important. Again, those parliament to parliament relationships are really, really important. So I, I never like giving advice to uh, foreign leaders because you always get it wrong, especially with this distance that we have between the two and the political situation on the ground is different. The, the one thing I would say though is there's always talk in Kurdistan as about uniting all the different parts and everybody seems to be in a rush and I see it more as a long-term project. And I, I always talk about how the different political parties in the different regions need to at least reach some type of basic agreement on what is the, the, the outcome that's wanted. And uh, let, let's be frank, like the region has Iran, which is not a friendly regime to any type of democratic movement or friendly to any Kurds. And you see with Kalbar Kurds who are being shot for crossing the border, trying to get goods across the border into like Kermanshah and regions uh, that are in desperate need just of basic supplies. And we saw after the earthquakes that uh, the Iranian regime refused to provide aid or, any, or allow support to actually get into there. And then you have Turkey, which has serious, uh, like 
Canadians have serious concerns about the authoritarian slide in Turkey. You have Syria, which is basically a failed state, despite Bashar al-Assad having essentially won most of the civil war. So it's not a friendly region if you're as a, like uh, a democratic movement just starting out, which is why I always encourage anybody is um, if, if you want Western support, you have to play by Western expectation of the rules. So basic human rights need to be protected. Basic democratic rights need to be ensured. And it's not always easy. It's not always simple. But in the long term, uh, it, it gets you that Western support that you want. Because us as Western parliamentarians, as a Canadian parliamentarian, I'm responsible to constituents in my writing. And I always like going back and telling them, uh, we fought with the Kurdish people. We fought with them to fight off Daesh, ISIS forces. And it's always something, it's a, it's a moment of pride for a lot of Canadians knowing that we did the right thing, but we did it alongside our allies. And there were Canadian special forces that fought alongside Kurdish Peshmergas, uh, wearing the same uniforms, wearing their brands on their uniforms and the flag of uh, the Kurdistan regional government on their uniforms. So it's a point of pride we're able to do that. And but I, I always encourage Western leaders whenever possible to um, you know, take up our, the types of democratic rights that we share with our citizens, that their citizens should be able to enjoy them as well, because it works. Mm -hmm. uh, that's important in every single government out there. Okay. Corruption undermines your civic institutions. Corruption undermines people's faith in your institutions and the ability of politicians to make decisions uh, for the best interests of the community instead of the best interests of a small group of people. Uh, corruption is also incredibly wasteful. It wastes a lot of taxpayer dollars and the revenues that are always in short supply because you always have an infinite amount of things that your population is asking you to do and you have a limited amount of resources. And you've seen uh, anti-corruption drives all across the world in Western governments and in authoritarian governments. And Canada's not immune to it either. We have issues with corruption as well, but we always try to legislate good laws and put in place processes and systems to get rid of it. Is it more dangerous than ISIS or Daesh? I'll leave that to... Uh, uh, the leadership of the KRG to decide that. But uh, I think on the ground, it's corrosive to the long-term uh, integrity of the democratic system and to the long-term integrity of the parliamentary system that the KRG is trying to establish. That's pretty, that, that issue, like it comes up all the time. That's what most governments are asked to do is to make sure you get the economy right so uh, that the private sector, private businesses, just everyday people uh, can have all the opportunities that are available without having government get in the way and stop them from creating new jobs and developing their own businesses and growing the economy. Uh, that's always been an issue in the region because you, the historic uh, relationship between the government and business has been that uh, these were command and control economies. I mean, uh, under King Hussein in, um, or that was King Faisal in, in, uh, in Iraq before Saddam Hussein took over. It was a command and control socialist economy. And so I, that, that history, you know, 30, 40, 50 years of that type of economy, you can't just change overnight. And nor should anybody expect it to change uh, overnight and really simply. But allowing small local businesses to grow is about getting the, the government out of the way. You, what you've got to be doing is setting the baseline rules. And that's what government is typically good for. Basic, basic rules that everybody knows and understands are easy to abide by. And then the difficult relationship with Baghdad and Erbil, that's something that local politicians need to figure out. It's not something that the Canadian government should get uh, involved in at all. So they, they, they shouldn't lose faith in Western governments. I know there's a there's a lot of people who felt that they were abandoned, especially after uh, the end of the war with uh, Daesh and ISIS happened, and then everything that happened with the referendum, is uh, don't lose hope. There are lots of other uh, parliamentary associations, both in Britain and in Congress, are still working on it. There are still a lot of parliamentarians in, in different Western countries who are still paying attention to Kurdish issues and what's going on in the region in Kurdistan. And we still care, and we're still paying attention, and we're still pushing our governments to do more than what they've done in the past. Good luck.